Oh, well, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name's Gavin Bannerman. I'm the Executive Manager of Queensland Memory at the State Library of Queensland. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we gathered today, uh, tonight. Um, Kirrupa Point is a traditional meeting place um, and we gladly continue that tradition tonight of sharing and, and celebrating <laughs> stories. Um, I'd also like to just extend our gratitude towards Dr Stanton Mellick and Professor Jill Mellick who provided the funds through the Queensland Library Foundation to make the Letty Katz Award possible. Um, John is our inaugural Letty Katz Award recipient. Um, and I just, I just like to think we really fell on our feet with John, you know, we <laughs> for, for our first um, offering, I think we, we really did outstandingly well. So um, John, as the, you know, presentation says, we'll be providing you with an overview of his research that he's done as the first Letty Katz Award recipient. I think this is the fun bit. I think the beginning of any research project is daunting. People think, where do I start? What do I do? Who do I talk to? But this is the bit where we get to um, see all those gems, see the rabbit holes down which people go, see the connections that have been made and celebrate the new knowledge, hopefully, that's been uncovered. We rely on people like John to come at our collections with fresh eyes and to interpret our collections and make sense of them for larger audiences. So I just really want to thank John for bringing his perspective and enthusiasm to our collections. Um, and I'd also just like to give a few quick plugs. Um, firstly, that we do have an annual um, fellowship and awards program. So keep your eyes peeled. It's starting to ramp up again in early 2018. The call for applications will, will come out. So look at our website and social media and um, there'll be a new round of uh, awards and fellowship opportunities open for everybody. And I'd also just like to give a quick plug to the um, Freedom Then Freedom Now exhibition, which is up on level four in the Philip Bacon Heritage Gallery. It's part of the collection tour, which is happening after John's talk up on level four but we do have a program of exciting exhibition um, exhibitions planned in that space and if you keep your eyes peeled John does feature in one of the videos in that exhibition so um, we've really got our use out of John <laughs> over his time here um, yeah. I'd also just like to quickly extend my um, thanks to the staff that have made this event and others possible um, Laurel Dingle our Queensland music coordinator Chrissy Theodosio and Troy Keith so thank you particularly for for pulling tonight off um, so I just can't stress enough how important it is to have people like John. Um, we thank him very much for his enthusiasm and everything that he's brought um, to his research here. It's been a pleasure working with him and we hope to continue on that relationship uh, into the future. So welcome and hope you have a good night. Thank you. The summer of 1977 stretched like elastic across a bleak Christmas. Bellbird reached its logical conclusion with the arrival of the hippies and John Quinney's disappearance on an extended cruise, neatly overlapping the truly bad opening episodes of The Restless Years, oddly featuring my Uncle Kerry as James Moran, father of Stephen and stepfather of Rick. My little post-suburban hippie life was reaching its conclusion as well. <laughs> Behind the City View car park, home of the Spring Hill Fair, was the Pink Palace. Tony Blake, also known as Fredo, and I lived in the palace that summer and he drew me into his little plans. He was running a variation on the notion of a restaurant in the activities centre at the University of Queensland. Two meals on the menu and some booze. Some friends and I played music in a hessian-bound nook, blues and boogie. The fact that there are photos proves that someone else was there. <laughs> I did a couple of lazy, small posters for Tony. The design of these little things was as confused as my dress sense. Fredo paid me, don't ask with what, but he wanted something more striking. Brian Doherty went to high school at Yoronga, and among many other skills, he was taught how to screen print by his influential art teacher, Lauren Willis. It was the grounding that enabled him to make this beautiful poster with all its trickiness, with its water lilies and deep water and its joyous singing frog. And in 1983, to take on the job of screen printer at Activities, a large and breezy bright area at the back of the University of Queensland Union Complex. Below the workshop space was a kiln and pottery around the corner from the seditionary rabble at Triple Z, 
and above it the refectory with an occasional waft of horse meat and despair. It was a hive of, well, activity. The screens themselves were simple. Silk stretched over timber frames, taut with anticipation when new, disinterested and slack after repeated encounters with the squeegee. But the methods of preparing artwork and printing were varied. Many artists and musicians came from the mid-70s pool of architecture students at the University of Queensland. Some of them made a band and headed north in a ludicrous bus in the summer of 1978, accompanied by the newly minted go-betweens. Peter Loveday was one on the bus, and he and his supports bandmate Geoffrey Titley designed and printed this poster, probably in the activities workshop. Geoffrey moved to London and ended up playing drums with the Desperate Bicycles, famous proponents of DIY culture. It was easy, it was cheap, go and do it. Pretty soon, Love Day, too, left Brisbane for London with his band Tiny Town. He was and is a maker of lovely posters. These are silkscreen prints from paper cut stencils, though some are more torn than cut, printed in London in the early 80s. The paper stencils have a beautiful handmade quality about them, but they fall apart after about 30 prints, the ink dissolving the paper, the edges bleeding and blurring, colours blending as the squeegee swipes across the screen, creating complex backgrounds and unlikely, unpredictable shapes. As this bus was winding its way up the Queensland coast to a paucity of applause and some no doubt murderous glances, I moved from the palace into a share house in New Farm. And here we are on the veranda, in the midst of that summer of 1978. Questions, inventions, interventions into the Brisbane reality, and I lost my hair. Those faces belong to Gary Warner and Adam Walter, schoolmates of Brian Doherty. They too were imbued with a righteous ability to create and the notion that being an artist was a valid pursuit for life. What lucky boys to have a teacher like Lauren Willis. At my school, art was elbowed out by rugby league in grade eight. And that's how we ended up with Fatty Vorton. <laughs> but the processes and attitudes that Willis shared with the boys in the early 70s changed their lives. I had never quite met people like this. Of course, screen printing wasn't the easiest of poster making methods. The photocopier was our friend, both as a design development tool and a printer. A3 photocopies were a cheap and useful method of getting the word out and could be coloured in with felt pen or crayon. We had quite a lot of time on our hands. Screen printing though meant big bits of paper and multiple colours and feeling just a little like Andy Warhol. The art assembly line. The next step up from paper cut stencils was ruby lith sheets of thin red film on a clear background instead of being surrounded by tiny bits of paper covered with tiny bits of red film. But by the late 70s, photo emulsion arrived and the scissors were generally discarded. So here's the thing. In 1979, the fourth annual Planning Students Conference was held at UQ. Sue Hall did the drawing of the peanut eating cane toad and the punky ransom note lettering was by Guy Gibson. They took the artwork to activities where someone helped them make a screen and then they did the printing. And my band played. Here's proof, that's me on the right. I have no memories of this particular evening. <laughs> Though there was a fire in the fuse box that a punk put out with a wet mop. <laughs> a WHS nightmare. Though it wasn't a workplace. And uh, we were no doubt in poor health and the only, the only safety was in the pins. Photo emulsion meant we could actually use photos in the artwork, either contrasted into useful shapes or dot screen to break down the continuous tone of the photo into something printable. This Pink Beauty by Alan Martin employed his favourite font and had a striking headline. The joint efforts at the University of Queensland and at Cloudland attracted some beautiful art by Alan and Terry Murphy, among others. Damien Ledvich, who sadly left us earlier this year, had an eye for composition, a grand sense of humour and a fine hand. These screen printed posters are filled with style and rooted in simplicity. They simmer with the sophistication of his drawing skills. Though on occasion, 
the offset printer was evoked, maybe for larger runs, especially with simple artwork or very complex artwork. No more fumes, just drop off the artwork to the gentle sound of the presses, a rhythmic swoon. This, for a dance that went horribly wrong, was designed by Gary Warner and me. It was the first job sent our way by David Darling, then 4ZZZ's promotions guy who had moved up from Melbourne in February of 1978. Me, scrawling down names on a scrap of paper as I was being cooked in the phone box around the corner. Gary, reading up about home lobotomies. Paul Curtis also worked at home, designing and printing posters and T-shirts, running a label, managing bands, promoting and touring. He hand-cut ruby lith for block colour and used photo screens for detail, and he still had a fondness for paper cut work and the flaws that crept in, the accidents that can surprise and delight and reveal character. He loved the colours in the Permacet ink range and used recycled paper stock at the printers for its more absorbent qualities. The Fugazi poster from 1991 was screen printed from this pen and ink artwork, while the regurgitator was offset in 2011, based on artwork built in software both ends of a techno spectrum. So the paper and the ink hold ideas and inspiration. All the visual influences soaked up in a young life, a language that includes Man Ray and Mayakovsky, Milton Glaser and Art Spiegelman, Rick Griffin and Bill Griffiths. But these posters also speak to our peculiar town and its particular past. Tony and Jerry Bellino opened Pinocchio's in 1971, and I can imagine it was probably quite a lively joint in its early days. By the time we started playing shows in the valley in late 1979, these strange rooms were quiet, dark little places like libraries for the semi-possessed. Upstairs, there was always other things going on. Other things. John Reed started it. He managed Razar, and he must have approached the brothers Bellino about Romeo's and then Pinocchio's. They were both in Ann Street, about a block apart, and both were walking distance from our practice room at Kemp Place, which we very much liked. Now, Romeo's had a bit of a feel to it. The speakeasy entrance, the curtain, the signage, the stripper who came on after we were done with our stylings. We tried to inject a little spice into things with our experimental Super 8s and home butchered haircuts, but we didn't make a dent in the flat looks of the regulars. This little paper cut number printed at home resorts to abuse, threats and collage as methods of enticing a crowd. Strangely, none of these worked. A year later, David Darling opens up the Silver Dollar at what was the Terminus, one of the premier gay clubs in the city, according to Peter Hackworth. There are scant photos of the interior of this joint, but Paul O'Brien shot off a roll the night of a zero show. It has that underground vibe, and most importantly, we felt very much at home, but his camera was falling apart, as was the band. I think this person may be John Baird, our sad dancer. Time tends to make liars of us all. Lindy and Michael eventually left to other pursuits and Arena and I continued as zero with an X because we liked photocopiers. What's not to like? After adding our dear buddy Claire McKenna on drums. Peter Williamson, David Darling's predecessor at 4 Z, had opened the Queen's Hotel Beer Garden as a venue in mid-78. But by late 79, they had left the radio station to create an entertainment empire. They had the valley covered with the silver dollar and in the flush of the new year of 1981, the Piranha Brothers opened the 279 Club at the Exchange Hotel on Edward Street. This poster by Tanmay Malcolm Skewis is one of a cluster of four designed and hand coloured by the pair of us. They were the first posters, I think, for the new venue before Terry Murphy began a long period of being the house designer and printer for David. We loved the 279. It became the centre of a little world for a while, but there was, like in all relationships, a little falling out. Now, this is an A3 photocopied poster from June 1981 with a screen-printed heading, no doubt printed at home, with a paper-cut stencil by Gary Warner. We were outraged at the behaviour of the bouncers. And although there were many other pubs and clubs in the city through the 80s and 90s, the truly independent in spirit would hire a hall and a PA. 
would get some buddies together, print a poster, and make like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. Hey, I've got a swell idea. Let's put on a show. Why, it'll be the most up-to-date thing these hicks around here have ever seen. <laughs> this fantastic relic, no doubt of some whiny evening, is screen printed on continuous feed printer paper by Michelle McIntyre and has the whiff of the public servant about it. The art, the typography and the illustration are painted straight onto the screen with block out. I apparently advised her to do that. She decided after this she would never do this again. She was having a fundraiser for the printing of her excellent fanzine rat sack at a hall in Indrapilly. A heap of hall in the midst of the shops on Boundary Street at West End was a popular option in the early 80s. It had a country town faded glory feel to it. This poster by Shane Knight for a cabaret evening a week before Christmas in 1981 is a lovely thing. The brown paper is as delicate as the beautiful lines and shapes. But there are dark horrors lurking in Brisbane just below the surface. An intriguing alternative advertisement by Andy Neal for the same show speaks for itself. <laughs> but the queen of them all was Baruna Hall in Caxton Street. This lovely thing by Chris McKimmy, drummer in the Lamingtons, had a lyrical buddy. The hall was home to many fundraisers and political dances, theatre and music and film, poetry and dancing and life, really. I played this song, the first song I ever wrote, as an homage to our buddies, the Swell Guys. They used to do Shadows and Ventures covers, so I thought a sort of surfing instrumental was appropriate. I've never been surfing in my life. That's not necessary. So I haven't played that since, uh, you know, 1980 um, or something. Uh, that can just linger there while I, while I think about that. Uh, hey? Just sort of getting the mood. Uh, that song, it was called 19X21. I have no idea why it was called that. But, um, uh, yeah, I haven't... We, we only ever played it a couple of times. I was telling Michael this before... At, uh, there's only one recording of it and it's, um, uh, it's at Baruna Hall, it's a live recording and uh, we play it. We actually do a really good version of it. It sounds really lively and I'm playing really well. 
and uh, the band sounds really good. And it would have been an odd one for the band to play because people would have had to, Irena would have had to play the bass and that wasn't her first instrument and stuff like that. Lindy was kind of doing, you know, that stuff she does. And um, um, at the end of it, there's this kind of, you know, <laughs> smattering of kind of lazy applause. And uh, Robert Forster's up the back of the room and he yells out, John Wilstead, Tom Verlaine. And it's kind of, it's, it's, it's on the tape. It's stuck in my mind now for 30 years or something. I think it's a very good compliment, by the way. <laughs> okay. As the posters reflected the times in their style and production processes, they also tell other stories. They carry the attitude of those who are sick of being told what to do and how to act. Queensland really was a shithole in many ways, and it peaked in the 80s as the bitter end came rushing towards the government and the cops. It was a given. You couldn't separate life and politics. It's important to remember that we weren't alone through these years. This poster from 1978, designed by Chips McAnulty, who was an integral member of the Earthworks Collective, shows the boldness of the idea being matched by the visual. And just as there was lots of rock raising money for good causes, there also was a fair bit of this sort of thing. And this. But the posters aren't all about the message. There's so much more than that. This beautiful strip by Andrew Wilson is a delight. It has red and black, always good for the Mayakovsky nuts or the lefties from the bookshop of the same name. It has giraffes, which are giraffes. It has delightful proportion and it has cut out bits of paper glued to it. And then there's this, both beautiful and shameless. Walsh had been appropriating great imagery forever, like this poster for Out of Nowhere, his Post Apartments band. Printed by Gary Warner, it's a beautiful, loving steal from the poster for Otto Preminger's Bonjour Tristesse, a late 50s cinematic delight. This is another Chris McKimmy from a Lamington show. He did many of these, and they tell a story of a band moving through time and through the city. And while we're on the red and yellow, look, it's another Peter Loveday. Two different artists, 10 years and almost a cultural generation apart. Both sets of posters are a gathering of dates and places, of course, but the style and the process binds them together into a coherent story of the growth of a band. They connect to imply song lists and songs and relationships with other bands. The band is embedded in a scene as described by the posters. They are markers on a wild trip, a crazy ride, a creative life. Still kind of stuck on the colours, a needle in a groove. Moving through the years, here are two joyous things. Natalie Jeremijenko's posters for the first two Livid festivals. They have the sunlight of those Queensland summers pouring out of them. The joy of the music, the essence of the big top and the carnival. Nat captures in a very direct way the change that was happening around her. A change partly of her own making. Livid, started by Peter Walsh and Natalie, transformed Brisbane's musical identity permanently. John Kennedy developed a visual style through the publishing of vinyl and cassettes and their accompanying ephemera. Covers, lyric books, posters and handbills through the early 80s. He was an architecture student with a clear ambition to write songs that people would like. Pop songs. Anathema to the bands that I was in. This poster, designed by Steve Stavrakis from Waterfront in Sydney, uses a version of typography that had been consistent through all of the JFK releases. Consistency was also key to the work of John Foy. John produced many posters, both design and printing for Red Eye Records bands through the 80s and 90s, among many others. He had designed a number of Riptides posters and Mark Callahan borrowed his visual borrowed his visual ideas for these two posters. So John didn't do these, but Mark did. The Riptides were famous for their constant reformations. I think I was in one. But appropriation and reworking are tenets of free culture. Many of our early posters and handbills used d images directly from other sources or redrawn cartoons or re-recorded sounds and phrases. We were part of a con continuous stream of art making that stretches back into the dark but making commentary on the state of our worlds in the light of the present. This is well understood by Cal Crilly. 
these images, photocopied and manipulated and added to, are representing the core of punk culture as it travelled and transformed through the 80s and the 90s. And just like the literally hundreds of handbills and posters and original artwork that Cal has donated to the library, every one of these posters comes as part of someone's collection. Kaz Black lived in the terrace houses on Corro Drive in the early 80s. This was her living room back then. I'm drawn to these photographs again and again. They're like time travel. I torture myself. Maybe if I squint a little more, I'll be able to make out the book titles. But it's like so many rooms that I'm sure we all lived in, the posters and handbills papered the walls. There was always recognition or envy when a visitor slumped into a chair. I have to admit this, by the way. Somewhere back there on a drunken night at a drunken party at Warwick Veers, I stood staring at the side of his fridge. Michael Callahan's What Now Mr. Mao, a spectacular memento of a great night at Griffith Uni Refec, the go-between zero, the swell guys, I didn't have a copy of this poster. Even though we put up with the grumpy, drunken Michael in our house in New Farm when he first arrived from Sydney to set up the screen printing workshop at Griffith. So I tore it off the fridge and we made a run for it. Mr. Mao stuffed up under my winter coat. Winner, hey? Yeah, Warwick put the word out. It didn't take very long. I had to take it back. It wasn't my memory, it was his. And I got that. There have to be some rules. But some of my memories are in here, in the posters I designed, and for that I'm very grateful. This pool party was a beautiful night down at the Ithaca Baths, warm and a bit boozy, awash with great music, a languid evening only disturbed by a fight in the girls' toilets. And this thing, printed out at activities by Terry and Gary and me, the artwork done at New Farm. And this, Irena and Claire and I splayed out in Brisbane Arcade, ready to make a brand new band from the sharp shards of the old one. A memory of a very funny day full of love and hope and the future. And now I return here at the end to Peter Loveday and some beautiful screen prints that didn't quite make it into this collection, but they point towards an essential theme through these years. Meanness of spirit was rife and respect for the young and the different was in short supply. So we respected each other. We made things for one another, posters and music and fun. And the posters represent that giving and it's why they're precious to people. They're triggers for the intangible assets of our culture. The indefinable stuff that binds us together. The same stuff that drew you here tonight. These four streets make up a crossroads and not quite Normanby five ways, complementary views of the same intersection. We all look at posters differently. They draw us back into a Brisbane that's long since disappeared, into the vaporous, untouchable essence of our youth, equal parts promise and chaos. Like houses in a suburban street, each one holds stories, faces, names, night and noise, love and loss and laughter. An intact community of musical interest, united by purpose and proximity, that defines in some ways the identity of this very distinct town through a particularly fractious time. From where we stand, looking back, the street rises and dips in waves into the distant falling dark, looping power lines, the last blush of the sunset picked up in the light that glows from open door and window the drift and swell of those easy sounds of life at day's end. And if looking back at these images reminds you of a time in your life when you felt free and happy, and a time when you learned how to be the person you are now, decades later, then the value of the posters is assured. Your memories combined with all of ours to continue to build a more sophisticated, nuanced and immersed relationship with our cultural history. Thank you very much. I can I can roam now. We could probably turn the house lights on, I reckon. It's very theatrical, isn't it? House lights. So I'm happy to take some questions and um, then uh, I'm going to go upstairs uh, and Troy's going to do something about... Oh, he's got a microphone. I honestly don't think we need it. I, oh, it's not the video. Ah, oh, the video, yeah. 
video recording. Yeah. Um, okay, so does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask me about? I've been here for 18 months, I think, or two years working on these posters. And um, see, don't bother with the questions, I'll just talk. <laughs> uh, and, you know, all I, I didn't, it was a strange uh, process. I just put a call out on Facebook and said, OK, uh, if you've got posters at home and you're like me, you're getting to an age, you know, I'm 60 this year, and your kids are grown up, say, and you're downsizing, or you look at something, a box of something, and go, why the fuck do I still have that after all these years? I haven't even looked in there for 30 years. You know, how much does it mean to me that I don't even look in it? So um, I just put this call out, and I was very lucky. Over time, I got about 350 things sent to me, um, mostly posters, some handbills, but, um, uh, and I consider that to be... I don't know, a beginning or something? I'm not even sure. I don't think this is a thing that starts and stops. I think that um, uh, what I was trying to sell people on was this idea that um, what is the value of the thing to you? <coughs> and how might you be able to, um, uh, to add value to it for the community, you know, and for the future? And so one way of doing that is by giving stuff to the library. But it's really important that it's, you know, not just kind of dumped at the library. And so, really, my part in this has been to be able to contextualise that stuff in some way, to be able to, even at its most simple level, to say, this gig is this date, it's this year, the artwork was done by this person, and there are these bands playing. You know, just a certain amount of information in a spreadsheet that kind of identifies the sweep of stuff that's in there. And then to do things like this. So, uh, you know, other people may very well have written a... a um, hey, Kimmy. Uh, other people may very well have written a, um, you know, a, a paper for a conference or something, which is probably stuff that I might do. But I am inclined to do this because this is just what I do. Um, and so, you know, there's that. I don't see that it ends. I expect people to, you know, keep giving stuff to the library. I think it's a really fantastic place to leave stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the stuff that gets digitised, it's available to people forever. Um, and... Uh, Though there's a whole layer in, in accepting this stuff, you know, not that I accept it, I accept it on behalf of the library, but it just goes in there to the thing, the giant beast. Um, but, you know, a lot of these things, because of the, uh, the age that I am, a lot of these people, they're punk people. You know, you know you're here. It's, um, and what is it with trusting the institution? Who trusts a library? The library's the arm of the government, you fool. And so I get that, OK? I acknowledge that. Um, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, what is better? You know, this place... Well, that American method of the paper paper yeah, uh, that, uh, uh, that's very true. Shane, you, it, it's a very... You make a, a good point. And somebody else said to me, um, brought up this notion that, you know, do you want your stuff in the hands of, you know... Tim Nichols, I suppose, would be a, you know, Rob Borbidge, I don't know. Um, and, the, and the answer is, of course, no. But at the same time, where else, where else does the stuff go? You, you, you know, one, somebody made an argument to me that they could, it could go to the Friar Library out at UQ, say. And that's quite true. It, that stuff can go there, you know, if they're happy to take it. And it's a great library. But this is the same university that gave Joe Bielkert Peterson a law degree. So no institutions are... <laughs> Uh, free from political interference or, uh, you know, or fault. No, no system is perfect. And so I see this beautiful place as being as close to perfect as I can find. And so I'm happy to suggest to people that they can trust this place and that there are people here who will look after their stuff and love it. And I think that's just really important. Um, <coughs> and, uh, oh, thank God. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, John. It is. Thank you very much for um, your presentation. Uh, two things. What actually, how did you decide what would stay with the collection and what was too old, too faded, torn up? I didn't make any decision like that. Great. I took everything. And so there are things there that are being fixed. And so the library is fantastic at fixing things. You know, that's uh, what they do. There's nothing that in there that somebody said, oh, that is really, let's burn that. We'll go down by the <laughs> river and we'll burn it. Um, nobody's done that. The, I think the only thing about about giving stuff to Queensland memory might be is if they already have copies of things, then they would think about giving those things back to you. I don't think they would sell them or, or throw them away, but 
their tendency would be to say, look, we can't really take this because we already have one. Yeah. And it's not infinite that, you know, the fourth floor or whatever it might be, you know. Or we'll uh, recommend somewhere else as well. Or recommend somewhere else. And there are other places that will take stuff. And, you know, stuff like this, uh, stuff that's related to, related to culture, the National Film and Sound Archive, you know, because a lot of people are giving stuff to the library now, you know, audio tapes of the, you know, the rehearsal tapes or live tapes or, or the masters of their recordings. I think Tim Seward's just given a huge bunch of stuff to the library. And so, you know, that stuff happens. Yeah. Well, that was part two. Thank you. Because uh, a lot of us have been willing and wanting to put some, some forward, some gear forward. And it's nice to know that the, um, I think it's relatively safe here. It and, and it's nice and um, for all of us to share and look back. I mean, my hand bills from the 279 Club probably won't make it because they're too badly stained and torn, but I will promise you they will make it someday. But, uh, yeah, thank you for that. It gives us a place to put some stuff. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> oh, look, I'm over in the dark now. This is good. Oh, I was just... Um, I was just thinking, like, before 75, from about 72, there was a lot of bands, like punk bands, that might have had two songs or five songs, and yeah. they just played, played at people's houses. And I remember one place was the Blind Hall, which was pretty Gabba. funny. Yeah, because yeah, that was the only place that would take the punks, the yeah. Blind Hall. <laughs> but I was thinking if anybody could um, get some posters from around that area, it'd be pretty good, because... Yeah, the earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, this call was from 75 to 95 and people oh, just yeah. ignored that really and just gave me what they had. But yeah. I think uh, maybe it's just here. <laughs> this is a good way of explaining it. When I put something out on Facebook, it goes out to 98% of those people are in their late 50s. You know what I mean? The people 10 or 15 years older than me, they're not my Facebook friends. I wouldn't have them, but they're not, <laughs> they're not my Facebook friends. And so they don't get to hear that stuff. And th there are, of course, you know, Facebook groups of people who are devoted to um, 60s Brisbane bands and, and that kind of bleeds into the 70s. And you're right. There's a bit of energy, you know, around this idea that well, why are we always going on about the punks? I did this... Um, I did a press conference with the Premier the other day at Big Sound because she... Cause I, 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 Sean and I and a couple of other people put in uh, for uh, some funding f from Arts Queensland to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the release of I'm Stranded by the Saints. And uh, we won, the, we, we won the, uh, the grant. And so uh, I had to go and t talk to the press. And anyway, this s s slob from Channel 9 just, I just said, Rightio, this is what's happening. And then she kind of shoved me in front of the microphone. So I'm there, it's like, you know, there's all these microphones. It's like I'm the Pope. And, um, <laughs> and this, this idiot from Channel 9 just kept saying, he would have said three times, what about Johnny O'Keefe? What about Johnny O'Keefe? You know, like that. And it's like, well, yeah, it's Johnny O'Keefe, great. You know, um, but I have no interest in Johnny O'Keefe. But that doesn't mean that other people aren't interested in Johnny O'Keefe. And I'm not, you know, with the, my ideas around the, uh, how we... Uh, uh, kind of invigorate our cultural history. Uh, there, of course, all the stuff I'm passionate about, that's the stuff I'm doing. Doesn't mean uh, other people can't join me and then go and I'll deal with the stuff that's from the late, from the 60s or from the early 70s. Because um, so I think it's a very open thing, and I, but I just think it's one of those things we don't, um, broadly, we live in Brisbane, we don't give a fuck about history and we don't give a fuck about culture. We, it's about progress. This is the place of progress and it's always been like that. And so. And I, of course, I you know uh, I, I admit that there are wonderful institutions here on the south bank of the <coughs> river that do a great job of of supplying us with wonderful things and um, making things known to us. But really, it's not in our f the fabric of the city, you know. And so I, I'm in the middle of trying to m change that somehow. Yeah, by doing things like this. There's a hundred and two of you or something. Hi, That's John. Right Hi, John. Thanks for your talk. Hey, I really like that you talked about the, the artistic design part and the techniques. And I was just really more interested in your research and whether any of that that you mentioned in terms of the media and the screen or the printing techniques or the papers, are any of those um, details being added to the library's catalogue of these collections that have come in? Yes, it's, it's a great question and the answer is no, because <laughs> because only because I have limited knowledge. I'm not a, I'm not a, I w I'm a screen printer, you know, for three years when I was 19 or something like that and I never knew anything much about it and 
uh, I can I could do it then and stuff. But and I've never got taught to do to design or anything, so I'm not really the best person for this. But there are other people who can add that sort of detail. I think my uh, expertise lies in uh, having a good connection to people, and uh, so my my expertise lies in in the history in a sense. So it's my I see my place as, as going this thing means something in relation to these connections here. And they're not necessarily about process or design. Um, they're more about these people knew one another. Th this is where their rehearsal space was. This is where they, their, pop their sort of gallery was. These are, this is where the venues were. I'm sort of more interested in that kind of, the notion of the, the city and the map and, and then how people connect to one another, you know, in their weird nodal kind of ways uh, across time. Yeah, that, that would make a great good, map. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can't know everything much as I'd like to. That was a really interesting um, presentation you gave. Um, I just had a question just around the, the posters and the design of them. I guess the, the goal of a poster is generally to advertise something. And a lot of the way that, you know, new sort of music things are advertised now through Facebook. So the posters sort of changed more as not with everything on it. Yep. Um, as I noticed some of those had to yep. just something's happening. Are there any other sort of changes that you've noticed sort of over the time period where stuff like that has changed? Yeah, the, I think what I said before is pr really true. Most of the stuff that I got starts in about 1979 and goes to about 1985. And then there's a big lump of stuff from the late 80s and early 90s. But the idea behind me saying 1975 to 1995 there was a thought behind that, and that was uh, in 1975, somewhere in the mid-70s, uh, DIY culture, technology changed. Uh, it, it was possible to, f to go and get photocopying done cheap. Photocopies were everywhere. They weren't the size of this room and cost $8 million. Um, uh, cameras became smaller and more portable. Video cameras arrived in the world. Um, uh, like I said in the talk, photo emulsion arrived so you could you could do more sophisticated screen printing. So there was a kind of a, there's a shift in the late 70s and digital technology started to arrive as well. And so that also changed everything around how we um, captured and, and uh, stored, um, you know, vision and sound and a whole bunch of other well, data. I think computers were still there, so you can say that. Yeah, it's true. It, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and the universities were a largely kind of a figure in that. And it's funny, I wanted to talk about the universities and so I just didn't, couldn't do everything. Because the unis were a, are a big deal and um, in, in giving access, but also, uh, you know, as in Brisbane, as venues, you know, where Triple Z was, where activities was, where all the joint efforts were, it was a really big sort of hub, you know, uh, in the suburbs. It's a weird thing to have, s here's the city centre and then out in the suburbs we've got this thing where all this energy happens. And then the other thing, the other, I won't be a teacher, and the other thing at the, the other end was somewhere in 1995 um, or 1996, you know, I got my first Mac, um, you know, LC or something, I can't even remember what it was, and got on the interwebs, you know, and the first thing I found out was that William Burroughs had died that <laughs> week, which was great. <laughs> I'm not going back there. Um, but the, the idea that then within that next five or ten years, the, the notion of, of sort of social media starts to happen. Information spreads in a really different way. Posters are no longer really being used f in the same way as they were in the past. So you're quite right. And, and I thought for this thing too, I was going to try and find a poster that just had words on it, that just said, this is, you know, this band, this date, this place, because that's all the information that has to go on the thing. That's all you want people to know, that band, that place, that date, you know. But none of them, they're all full of art. You know, <laughs> no, but nobody just does these really kind of straightforward, here's the information, which intrigued me. I didn't get to the, you know, I didn't f pursue that, but it's really interesting because you make that good point. You know, what is the thing for? It's just to give you this information. So why the hell do people go on with the three colours and the, you know, anyway. Yes. I think you ate the Yes, well, or they, or they were the most, they were the, oh, yeah, they were the bland ones that you wrapped your chips in or whatever. <laughs> yeah. We. Uh, uh, Troy, you tell me when we're running out of time and stuff, oh, hey? Okay. Hi, Peter. John. Hello. I, I'm just wondering if any of the works of Cherie Bradshaw turned up yeah, in the I collection. Have a, there was a, none of them, I didn't have any Cherie stuff that was musical. 
I had some political stuff of hers. Uh, and I got a huge swag of political posters from a couple of different people, but it kind of fell out of the scope of, yep. of this particular project. Yep. And as you well know, Kimmy, you're a researcher. Um, you gotta, you've got to maintain the scope of things, you know, otherwise you just go out forever. Yep. You know, I could have gone on forever, seriously. I didn't have one, uh, you know, I talked about Ma uh, Michael Callahan in this thing, but I didn't show any of his posters, and yet his posters are remarkable, you know, and he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a transforming person in Brisbane screen printing, the sc Brisbane screen printing world, because he came in and kind of just did all this, look what you can do, and then went away again. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Thank you. That's okay. And Cherie did beautiful stuff. And there's lots of people who are no longer with us who are part of this story, and Cherie Bradshaw is absolutely one of them. That'd be the last question. There's somebody... Uh, nobody over here really wants to... Good on you. Well done. <laughs> you lot, you can go. No. There was a link in there, and I think it's probably infected everybody who turned up tonight of sort of triple Z and alternative sort of stuff. I, I can't. Re I lived in that era, and I just about every post I saw, I thought oh, I either wanted to go to that, or probably didn't, but wanted to go to every single th one of those shows. But what was happening out in the burbs? I, I, I can vaguely remember that there were things happening that weren't say alternative. There, there were surely there were bands at Wynnum and Redcliffe. And yeah, who cares? <laughs> Were they just crap at art and no one... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. We're all from the burbs. Nobody's from the inner city, but we all moved into the inner city. And, and that's that, you know, the nature of those waves of gentrification, you know, the living in New Farm and, in, and having sp spaces in abandoned buildings in the city was cheap and easy. So, of course, everyone moved into town. And why mm. the fuck would you want to stay in Stafford when... No, no offence, mm. my mother, but yeah. well, Stafford's a lovely place. But why would you want to stay there when you could live in New Farm and, and have a, you know, and the whole level of a massive warehouse in the valley for twenty-five dollars a month or something? You know, it's just so no one submitted things for places. You thought, wow, I never even well, heard you know, of this some band. Some of those things were in the, sh the gigs were at Indrapilly RSL, so you know. So what, what, as soon as the, you start talking about the halls, and like I said just before, I kind of ignored the universities when really Griffith and and St Lucia, you know, but they were both pretty, and you know, stuff happened at Kelvin Grove, you know, at the Teachers College as well. Orientation Week is, you could, you could write a whole book about, about O Week music in, in Brisbane in the 70s and 80s, you know, it would be, because bands used to come up, that's like, it's the tidy little earner, you know, doing that O Week sort of thing around the country. So, um, uh, yeah, but, it, you know, the suburbs don't really, the suburbs are more about where people come from, that's how I see them. I, I, I did a, I did a show in, in a couple of years ago at the Powerhouse and I talked about the suburbs a lot because all of the people in that story, and that's all of us, you know, we're, <coughs> we're all from the suburbs. We're from Capalabar or from Sandgate. Poor, unfortunate us. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. And so, um, Troy, there are... Yeah, we, um, we have a some of John's posters on display at level four. So uh, after this, you can either use a lift or the stairs. Um, there'll be staff members to direct. So yeah, come up and have and a look. And I'm going to go up there. So if you've got any questions about the stuff that's on display. And we'll have our music librarian, Laurel, there as well. She can yes. answer questions. And I purposely have put things in there that you haven't seen. And some things that I wasn't allowed to show here, which I can show upstairs. So, well, you know, naturally, people don't give us the posters that they print. They give us the stuff that they steal or to take off the street. They, they don't know who made it. So uh, we get a lot of stuff, the copyright for which still belongs to the artist. And so I can't do that with it. But I can take it out of the collection and shove it in your face. <laughs> we can get dirty with it, you know, and lick it and stuff. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You've all been extremely patient. <laughs> so thank you very much. See you.